A few days ago, a European philosopher said, if we could capture the youth of the world with a Christian ideology, the world might yet be saved. Here in Charlotte, thousands of young people are attending the meetings nightly. This has actually been a youth crusade. Of the 10,000 that have already come to receive Christ as Savior, over half have been young people. The same was true in San Francisco. This is one of the most encouraging signs of the present hour. Thousands of young people marching down these aisles to commit themselves to Jesus Christ. Dr. Dan Poling, editor of the Christian Herald, after a tour around the world in 1937, wrote a book entitled Youth Marches. Today... After 21 years, youth is still on the march. Everywhere I go, I find youth with the colors following the trumpets. Today, I want us to follow the banners of young people and see if we can catch some of the significance of their marching. Let us see if we can point them to their inevitable destination and warn them of the tragedy that awaits the whole world if their course is not changed. Youth today is yearning to be and to do, to attempt and to achieve. Adolescence is a period of adventure. Every young man or girl is the Columbus of a new world. Normal, full-blooded youth pulsates with the zest of living. Youth must find self-expression for all its developing powers of brain and body. The yearnings and longings of youth generally find expression in some slogan or watchword which crystallizes its quest for life. Particularly is this true of modern youth movements all over the world. American universities and colleges have their slogans. Every fraternity and sorority has its slogan. The YMCA, the YWCA, the Christian Endeavor Movement, Youth for Christ International, the Epworth League, the Baptist Training Unions, and a thousand and one youth organizations all have their slogans. Behind these slogans is the quest of youth to express its ego enthusiasm in some worthwhile job. Scores of communist youth organizations have stirring and challenging slogans that have gripped the hearts and imagination of communist youth everywhere. The youth of today are marching in China under the red banner of Mao Zedong. Thousands of South Korean youth a few years ago marched to their death for the government of Sigmund Rhee. India's youth, spurred by nationalism, are marching as never before. The youth of Iraq, have thrown off traditions of a century in their misdirected quest for freedom. The youth of Egypt are marching for NASA. The youth of Israel, the youth of South American countries are rising to meet the challenges of their day, marching under banners and slogans with colors flying and trumpets blaring. All over the world, youth is on the march. A few years ago, we heard the tramp, tramp, tramp of the youth of Italy the tramp, tramp, tramp of the youth of Japan, the tramp, tramp, tramp of the youth of Nazi Germany. These youth were directed by their leaders to a bottomless pit of destruction. Modern day youth, too, faces the tragedy of inevitable destruction and even annihilation unless the course of these marching millions is changed. These youthful marchers eventually and inevitably march against each other. To meet on some frontier in mortal combat, they need only continue marching as they march now. If and when they meet again, the world will stand on the brink of utter destruction and annihilation. Already contacts are being made on scores of international borders in Lebanon, on the Formosa Straits. All over the world, the situation has become explosive, and these youth once again will be at each other's throats. But this time, instead of machine guns and artillery, it will be with hydrogen bombs and intercontinental missiles. Youth usually marches at the call of personalities rather than for programs. They seldom know or seem to care what it is all about. They marched for Hitler. They marched for Mussolini. The Arab world today is marching for NASA. Youth marches at the command of overwhelming personalities who make vocal the issue and visual the program. I'm becoming more and more aware of the fact that people change people as much as ideas change people. The power of personality cannot be challenged. I could give many illustrations today to prove that personality many times supersedes ideas. Such is the case when we turn to Christianity. We find the secret of the power in Christianity. The secret of power is not in Christian ethics. Although Christianity has a system of ethics, the secret of power is not in Christian ideas or philosophy, although Christianity has a philosophy. 
The secret of Christianity is found in a personality, and that personality is Jesus Christ. Men have found other philosophical and ethical systems, but they have not found another Jesus Christ. Some of modern-day youth believe they're Christians because they believe in the Sermon on the Mount, but this does not make them a Christian. Some believe they're Christians because they keep the laws of the land, but this does not make them a Christian. Some believe that they're Christians because they belong to a church, but this does not necessarily make them a Christian. The mark of a true Christian is found in his personal relationship to the personality of Jesus Christ. Christianity is Christ. Christ is Christianity. I speak reverently when I say that Jesus is more important than his ideas. All that he said was true, but without him, even the truth would have been powerless. Men know the power of truth, and truth makes men free. But Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And again he said, If the Son will set you free, ye shall be free indeed. No personality in all of history stands above Jesus Christ. Agnostics and atheists have found fault with Christian ideas, but they can never find fault with Jesus Christ. They found fault with Christians, but they can never find fault with Jesus Christ. Christ transcends methods, ideas, and followers. He stands at the turning point of time. Men everywhere must bow to his superiority. Christianity is Christ, and those who are to be Christians must accept and follow him as a person. He and he alone is able to meet every need of the human race today. One of the problems in the church today is that we have called people to a program rather than to the person of Jesus Christ. And the greatest need in America today is for young people to arouse themselves and follow the flag of a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. Youth must have a powerful, persuasive personality to follow. Young people, I submit to you that Jesus Christ not only is the greatest and most powerful personality in the history of the world, but Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of the living God. It was Jesus Christ who before the foundation of the world flung planets into space from his flaming fingertips. It was Jesus Christ who scooped the valleys and built the mountains and hung the leaves on the trees. It was Jesus Christ who provides the air you breathe and the water you drink. The Bible declares him as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He took upon himself the form of a servant and humbled himself even to the death on the cross. God became man. He moved among men. He went about doing good. He made the blind to see, the dumb to speak, and the lame to walk. He not only showed, but provided mankind with a new way of life. He presented the greatest social manifesto the world has ever heard in his famous Sermon on the Mount. His death on the cross was voluntarily born in the love which he had for the human race. He died as a substitute for all races. He shed his blood that our sins might be cleansed. And on the third day, he rose from the grave and ascended to the right hand of God. He lives today. Hallelujah, Jesus Christ lives. And I offer to young people in America and throughout the world today, not a dead Christ, not a Christ who is still on a cross, not a Christ who is in the grave, but a living, resurrected Christ who is leading an army of young people on every continent to victory because we have the promise that someday the victory shall be ours because he is the captain of our salvation. He's the captain of our salvation. And today, thousands have dedicated themselves to follow this living Christ to death if necessary. This week, hundreds of young people here in Charlotte have given their lives to him and pledged themselves to follow him all the way. Young people by the millions in America have the assurance that in this topsy-turvy, bewildered, reeling, staggering world, that with Jesus Christ we are on the winning side. The Bible declares that he's coming back again to take his rightful place as King of Kings and Prince of Peace. And I submit to you that this is the only hope in this world of despair in which we live. The hope that Christ shall someday reign and the whole earth shall be subject to him and his prayer, thy kingdom come, shall have been answered when his kingdom shall cover the entire earth. I have found in order to challenge the youth of 1958, you must present a hard patriotism, not a patriotism of rewards and honors, but a patriotism of sacrifice, of daring, and of death. 
Whatever may be said about these youth marchers around the world, let this be said. Theirs is no dream of ease and peace. On a great banner of one of Hitler's youth encampments, there appeared these words. The highest duty of German youth is to die for the fatherland. Christ demands no less. Jesus Christ demands all. Youth does not want to be called to a life of ease. Youth wants something hard. Youth wants a challenge. Youth wants something to live by and something to die by. Youth needs and wants a voice and a leader. Communism demands absolute and unswerving loyalty to the doctrines and precepts of communism. Jesus Christ demands no less. Many people have an idea that they can be a Christian and live any way that they like. This is not the call of Jesus Christ. To follow Christ requires discipline. The words of Christ search deeply into the depths of our souls when he says, He that loveth father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. Later he amplified that statement of divine principle by saying, If any man will come to me and hate not his father and his mother and his wife and his children and his brethren and his sisters and yea, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. In other words, Jesus Christ said that you have to forsake all, even your own life, if you were to follow him. Yet in other places you say in the Bible, he tells us to love and cherish parents and brethren and sisters. What then did Jesus mean? He meant that we are to count all things, but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus our Lord. He meant as Paul said, I count them but refuse that I may win Christ. In other words, we are to make Jesus Christ supreme, permanent, preeminent in our hearts so that no person nor anything shares that place in our lives. No price or parents or loved ones or possessions of life itself are too great for his sake. A young student asked me on the university campus the other day, Mr. Graham, can you tell me anything worth living for and dying for? I'm tired of psychology and philosophy. I want to live dangerously and adventurously and courageously. I said, young man, if you really mean that, I can tell you a cause exemplified in a person that can challenge every fiber of your being and thrill every drop of blood in your veins. He said, let's have it. Within an hour and a half, that young man had come to know Jesus Christ as personal savior. He got up off his knees and with a radiant face, he set his jaw, squared his shoulders and became a follower of Jesus Christ. To be a follower of Christ requires you also to bear a cross. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Again he said, and whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. The cross that he is talking about is not the cross on which Christ suffered for our sins on the tree, for we can add no part to the price of redemption. It is not the bearing of an outward cross around your neck as we see many times in America. It means the denial of self and all that life has to offer in full surrender to the will of God. The world dazzles us but it is dim in comparison with him. Loved ones allure, but he is the altogether lovely one. Thousands of you listening to my voice today can volunteer for the army of God with the assurance that in the end you will be on the winning side. All that you have to do is to surrender your heart to Christ. By faith you receive him into your heart. He will forgive your sins and give you such inward peace of soul, conscience, and mind that you will find for the first time in your life that you are really living. Young people, do you want to live life with a capital L? Life with adventure and courage? Come to Christ today. Give him your heart and start life all anew. Follow his flag. Serve in his army. And I guarantee that victory shall someday be ours. We must go to the cross, however, in self-discipline, self-denial and cross-bearing. And then comes the victory and the crown. Are you ready to go and suffer? Are you ready to endure hardness to follow Christ? If so, bow your head right now and give your life to Christ and serve him with everything you have. It's much easier to die for Christ than it is to live for Christ. I'm asking you to go back to the shop, back to the business, back to the high school campus, back to the university campus and live Christ. No matter who sneers, no matter who laughs, no matter who called you foolish or non-intellectual, come by faith, give yourself to Christ and follow him and you will find a new life. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we pray that youth all over the world will enlist in the army of Christ, coming first to his cross for forgiveness, sharing his glorious resurrection 
and anticipating his coming again. May we live for him in every area of our culture and society. For we ask it in his name. Amen.